need to record now. Thank you. Up, uh, good. So uh, as promised, and that's actually good that some people tried to solve the exercises. So you, you remember from last time, just very, very briefly, we defined some magic uh, operation that we call the Poisson bracket, like this one, right? And I think we sort of agreed that this is true. Uh, I mean, those who tried, they realized that this is just a very easy computation, right? If you want to differentiate, uh, if, you, if you want to plug in here like Q or P instead of F or G, then you see that almost all the derivatives vanish because the coordinates are independent. And when I say almost all, it's actually all but one where you differentiate, for example, Q here by itself or P here by itself. And then in the whole sum, there is only one term left. And this is precisely the term that we had, that we had, had here in the right-hand sides of the equations, right? So that, that was an easy thing to do uh, then we wanted to apply it to some like very simple mechanical systems. And normally in the first one, what you get is Q dot equals P, right? I just differentiate H by P. And I could do it with multiple Qs and Ps, but one is already, uh, is already something that I want to show you. And then P dot, is normally minus Q. And uh, secretly, you probably recognize the usual harmonic oscillator equation, right? Q double dot uh, plus Q equals zero. And uh, either you remember how to solve it or you spent uh, five minutes writing the appropriate equations, you would see that the solution would be something like uh, Q is uh, a combination of cosine T and sine T, right? And these coefficients you would determine from the initial conditions, right? From Q of zero and P of zero, remembering that P is obviously Q dot, which you can just compute from here. So th th this is kind of an easy, an easy differential equations, the system of differential equations. Um, what happens if you draw the phase portrait of it? So does uh, do, do all of you know what is a phase por portrait? I think from high school you kind of have some memories, even if you're a first year student. So you, in in our terms, a phase portrait would be a curve in this QP plane, right? And uh, what would you see here? What would you see here? The, the answer is actually very easy. We agreed that for a Hamiltonian system, the value of the Hamiltonians is, is, is conserved along the trajectory. So what you're supposed to see is the level uh, curve or level set, if you're in higher dimensions of the Hamiltonian function. And the Hamiltonian function here is this, right? This simple thing, right? And what is the level set? Well, you obviously guessed that would be a circle that doesn't look like a circle in my picture, but topologically it's a circle. So, uh, and the dynamics of the system would be just moving along this circle uh, clockwise, right? So actually what you do, you fix the initial conditions, Q0, P0 from here, and then you start going along this circle. And when you project a point on the Q axis, you would get this thing. 
and when you project the point on the p-axis, you would get this thing that I didn't compute, and now the picture is totally messy, but I think you get the idea, right? So actually, to get the qualitative behavior, I didn't even have to write the equation, so to say. I could just I could have just drawn this picture right away. And this is something that we will do in the second case. So the second thing is a little bit more complicated because okay, the first equation is the same, but the second equation is nonlinear, uh, right? Oh, actually, so I think I can, I, I should not have done to. Okay, this, this two is something else, right? I don't know if it was, if it was misleading, it was just cosine of Q. Uh, yeah, okay, I see some smiling faces. It probably means that, but actually both, both you cannot solve with, with the square or not, that will change a little bit the picture, but it will not, uh, it will not, uh change this well it will change the solution but it will not change qualitatively the picture and this guy is a little is kind of classical i mean actually you should have been hinted by this by, by the by the mechanics of the system because what i am supposed to recover here is just the force that acts on the particle right and the force that acts on the particle when you project it to the to that angle would precisely give you the sinus of this angle. So this force here, the gravity that I would project in the direction of of the angle I measure, right? Of this cube. Uh, okay, you tried it one way or another, but let's say um, let's say you have this equation to solve. And again, I uh, there is some kind of exact solution which involves elliptic functions. Uh, and elliptic functions are actually not functions, they're sort, sort of say integrals. And this bites itself by its tail immediately because these integrals are more or less defined as the solutions of this of this uh, equation. So if you type in Google elliptic function, you would get three of them. And in principle, you can program it into a calculator and it will just compute it at every point of time. But secretly what it will be doing inside the cal calculator, it will be computing some integral. So th this is a little bit cheating, but I can still draw this solution. Because again, I want to draw the level sets of the Hamiltonian now of this one. And let me try a very courageous thing. Don't do it when you teach. Uh, let me just ask Google to do it. So I will say I want to draw y squared, well, over two, but whatever, uh, plus Sign of x. So this is the, or more or less the Hamiltonian I'm studying. And yeah, miracle happens, you see some picture turning, right? Uh, the, the, this is the graph of this function y squared plus cosine x. And what we're interested in are the level sets of those. So you see this plane that is cut in the picture, and you see some kind of bumps inside. Actually, this is our uh, this is our answer. Now let me draw this picture again, but in two dimensions. So I'm looking now at this at this plane that we have just seen, that is cut in the surface. What you see are some kind of circles like that, and something is going around. And the circle, I mean, this is Q and P again, around zero actually sinus behaves a little bit like q and cosine behaves a little bit like q squared right 
So around zero, you have more or less the same phase portrait as in the previous problem, just a little bit deformed. Then if you go far from zero, there are two ways to go. If you go in the Q direction, but that's not very interesting because in the Q direction, you are periodic, right? The cosine is periodic and the sign here, the right-hand side are periodic. So actually I can just cut the picture in this kind of bands and the length would be to pi here to be on the safe side. And if I understand what happens in one band, then I'm done. I understand everything. And you also noticed in that picture that if I go very, very far away, I no longer see the bumps. I will just see some kind of curves like that. Okay. And this is also a trajectory. So I have one type of trajectories, like things turning around the equilibrium point and I have so oscillated around the equilibrium point. Or I have another type of trajectories that are now disconnected. This pendulum rotating. Okay, on the video, you don't see my finger rotating, right? So either you are oscillating like this, and this corresponds precisely to this part of the picture, or you have enough energy to make a full turn. And then since the energy is preserved, you would do a lot of full turns. This is the thing. And there is also a very special intermediate regime where you kind of start, start from, for example, the vertical upright position, but with a zero velocity and very, very slowly you go down, then you go up again. This is the green curve. Uh, or you do it the other way around. So you could tilt right or tilt left. And then this is the red curve. And attention, these are two different trajectories. So more or less, you come from a full stop, you make a full turn that takes a lot of time, and then you come back to, to the upright position. These are called separatrix regimes. And also the, this thing is, uh, this thing can be repeated periodically. So you can uh, think of doing some full turn, then maybe slowing down the system and then doing something like some, some other rotations. Hmm? Okay. So in a sense, I have the trajectories of the system. The only thing that is tricky here is to parameterize them. And this involves elliptic functions. So at any, at a, at a given uh, point in time, I don't know where exactly I'm in on this trajectory. I know roughly what happens, but since I have some linearity here, I don't know exactly. But, but the message is that knowing the Hamiltonian, I still can say a lot of things about my system. Is it fine for the exercises? So this is what I, uh, okay, the, the first one I think was easy to do. And the second one, you would never guess if you have never done that. Okay. And also one more short message is that even from very simple systems, like from very simple Hamiltonians, you can eventually get to uh, differential equations that you cannot solve, right? With this one, you don't really know what to do. And that's a happy coincidence that some people thought of it uh, 300 years before and they produced this elliptic functions machinery. But if I modify this a little bit, like for instance, how the typo was made here, then you can again spell out the equations. You can again draw the pictures, but you probably have uh, no way to do any explicit solutions here. Okay. Fine so far. Now, when I said that uh, this was 300 years ago, I actually didn't exaggerate. Let me very briefly go back to my, uh, to my, uh, yeah, to my transparencies. Uh, 
people have kind of understood some parts of this story ways way way ago so this first screenshot is the newton's work uh, question to the audience when was it roughly Well, at least the century. Yeah, that's enough time to Google it. Yes, 17th. And th this is something like 1666, I think, published a little bit later, but I think he understood it already. So um, what he was doing, he was exploring how the planets move. And back in the days, it was kind of a fashion because that's spectacular. Uh, people back in the days were still believing that the earth was round and it was also good to show to some politicians i mean back in the days you could find some king and put a telescope into the sky and say look in 15 minutes there will be some object passing by and then the king will be impressed and will give you a lot of money for your research actually not joking that's how the speed of light was discovered they wanted to show some some king how the satellite of jupiter was uh, uh, was showing up and uh, they missed it by 15 minutes so the king was like impatiently waiting and it was still not showing up and then they realized that the 15 minutes was precisely the time for light to travel from one point of the of the orbit to the other point of the orbit so it, it was supposed to miss the moment Okay, so Newton was just studying planets and actually he was pretty good in it. He formulated what we now call Kepler's laws and he did some very explicit computations. So basically he, he was able to predict the planets of moon, the, the moment of planet. The other screenshot is uh, Lagrange and you see it's still spelled in the old fashioned Lagrange. Uh, when is that? And you don't have to Google because there is a date. <laughs> yeah, challenge. Well, okay, 100 years later, a little bit. Sounds like uh, 18th, uh, right? 18th, uh, seven, 17th something, middle, end of, seven, end of 18th century. Um, what Lagrange was doing, he was reading Newton and trying to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, he also said, okay, that's cool. If you have just one planet going around uh, the sun, this we know how to do, but there are a lot of planets. So this should be somehow perturbed. And he was considering that perturbations uh, and realized that the whole space of trajectories has some properties, not just the qualitative property of one trajectory, but the whole space. And more or less, he didn't call it that way, but more or less what he discovered uh, was symplectic geometry. So he realized that on that big space of all possible trajectories, or let's say for the moment, all possible coordinates of velocities of the system, there is some structure. Uh, and then 200 years later, there, I'm willing to cite a couple of books. One is by Suryo and one is by Arnold, the Russian mathematician. Um, people started spelling out in the modern way. So people started writing actually symplectic geometry where symplectic geometry is. And if you want a more detailed lecture on this, this there is this Jean-Pierre Bourguignon who was basically telling the story I just told you in three minutes. Uh, in a long lecture with more examples and more fun anecdotes, but also more science. Uh, so he is actually explaining how Suryo read Lagrange and how he realized uh, that the symplectic geometry was already there. So when I put this online that you, you could follow the link or just Google Suryo and symplectic and you get this video. Okay. Uh, and. The, the, this classical story in the modern language would involve the things that I showed you last time. So last time we did this part and a little bit of this part. Let me maybe 
briefly, but still uh, clean up the mess a little bit. And also since now you have heard some geometric words from Anton and from Aiden, uh, at least let me, for the geometers in the room, let me identify the spaces we are living in and we are, uh, we are studying. So the first thing that we, that we did that we did last time was speaking about the description of the of the mechanical system and we agreed that it's enough to either give coordinates and velocities or give coordinates and momenta right and in what you have seen in Anton's lecture today if you speak about coordinates and velocities, you are actually working in the tangent bundle to the configuration space. So Qs are coordinates on this Q. And this big TQ is to say that at each point of Q, I'm taking a tangent space. This, way, this is where the velocities at the point Q leave. And then I put them all together. This is my tangent bundle. Okay, if you are a uh, first year student, you can probably just safely assume that locally this looks like R to N. So the, the, you have N coordinates and N velocities, but R to N with a little bit of structure. So this is actually R N. And at each point, you have a vector space also of dimension N, which is attached to it. So I want to distinguish them. I don't have to distinguish them because after all that will be a manifold, but I want to somehow say who are the coordinates and who are the velocities. Now, if you have this coordinates and momenta picture, then you live in the dual of this bundle. And again, you can safely assume that this is R to N, but a slightly different R to N. This, the first part is the same, you have the same coordinates, but the second part is this VN dual, okay? For operational purpose purposes, this is more or less enough. Uh, and now we agreed that in the Hamiltonian picture, if I give you a Poisson bracket on this space, and you plug into a Hamiltonian function, you get equations of motion, right? So if you prefer the uh, differential equation language, this is just <clears throat> a system of ODE, ordinary differential equations. But maybe from what you learned from Avian and from uh, Anton, you understand that this is the same as uh, a vector field, a vector field on T star Q in our case. So attention here, you take the whole thing, the whole T star Q, so the whole huge R2 N space, and you look at vector fields on that. Okay, so my T star Q is probably the thing that Anton called M, right? And I will see the dynamics on the whole thing. Now, if you prefer uh, to, to, to write it in components, that will be a vector field that we call XH by tradition that will have these guys as components, right? So you have N of such guys and N of such guys, okay? And these are precisely what you recover from the right-hand sides of your equation, right? Stop me if I'm going too fast or uh, uh, push me if I'm going too slow. Uh, and now, when I, well, the ultimate goal is obviously to solve something. So all solve the system 
of OD geometrically is the same as integrate integrate xh and integrate here means find a curve a curve in t star q such that xh is tangent to it literally in the sense Anton is telling me okay I I'm secretly looking in the internal structure I'm in T star and my tangent condition is something that the equivalence classes of curves uh, I can obviously say that I'm looking in the bigger space and that will be a, a tangent bundle to T star Q I'm not willing to go into these details but I think again you get the idea and now, if you remember Avent's lecture, or if you uh, were not there, then I really uh, advise you to go and look at the video. I think that was the second one where he defined the uh, differentials. Uh, uh, Avent, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there is another natural thing in the game, which is the differential of the Hamiltonian. So if you remember that language, Hamiltonian is a smooth function, so it's a zero form. I can produce out of it a one form by computing the differential and in components uh, that will be just partial derivatives by all the coordinates. Yes, oh, okay, there was no recording, but there are slides, I think, right? DPI. Or if you prefer the uh, differential notations, you would say that dh is, okay, I'm a bit lazy to write this, but that's this, dqi plus this dpi, dpi, and sorry for that, I can do that, but you probably can't. There is always the sum over i from one to n. Okay, and you look at these two objects and you obviously see that they are somehow related. So first of all, I you see I wrote one horizontally and one vertically. This is on purpose because somehow they live in the dual space, right? You remember that if you have a vector field, you can plug it into the differential form. This is kind of contraction operation and we will eventually do this a little bit later and you will see what what happens but already looking at the formulas you see that the terms start repeating themselves and they are actually related uh, they are related by well I can maybe just say matrix by matrix that we call G which is a 2n by 2n matrix that has a z block of zeros, a block of identities, minus identities, and zero again. Okay, and they are related in the way you think, right? So I just look at them as the vectors and I multiply a matrix by a vector. Uh, it, it, it is really a linear algebraic operation at each point of the phase space. But if I want to glue things together, this is what happens when you do vector fields in one forms. Uh, and you see this, this matrix is kind of very nice. So you, you can uh, reverse this argument. If you know XH and you want to compute DH, you can do that by just applying more or less the, the inverse of the matrix. So if I define omega to be the inverse of it, I get the relation in the other way around. And this relation is actually, okay, I will write it first uh, in the way you think, it's kind of omega applied to xh. But the usual differential geometric relation would be dh is 
contraction of this vector field with an omega. And there you kind of guess that omega plays the role of a two form, right? I have a vector field, I'm plugging it into some object and I get a one form. So this guy is a two form, a differential two form. And uh, I'm more or less parachuting them, but you can probably check that in this case, Omega is simply uh, DQI wedge DPI, again, sum from one to N and my usual exercise, right? I'm lazy to care about the signs, but I know that signs can be fixed to make the thing work. Uh, is it fine up to now? If not, protest. Okay, if I, by chance I didn't lose you, that's good. Um, this omega has a bunch of properties. First, omega is non-degenerate. And when I say non-degenerate, you have two ways to view it. Either you look at each point of the phase space and you see it as a multilinear map, right? That's a two forms, so it, it's two vector fields and gives you a number, or you can view it as a linear map from tangent from the tangent bundle to the cotangent bundle. And in both settings, the non-degenerate is what you think it is. So the only way to get zero as a result is to plug in zero as the argument. Uh, and the second property is the uh, global property so that this omega is closed. So if I compute the exterior derivative of it, the exterior differential, what I get is zero, okay? Actually, those two properties define the symplectic form. So if I have a differential two form on a manifold, which is closed and non-degenerate, people call this symplectic. And this is an example, but this is a typical example of a symplectic form, okay? Um, these two properties are actually very important uh, when we apply this to mechanics. Because if I'm, I say that I'm non-degenerate, It means that I can uh, reverse, I can read this condition in any way I want. Uh, for instance, what we were doing before, and it was very natural in the Poisson business or in the Poisson record business, in the symplectic business would mean that I take an H, I plug it, into the black box and I want to recover a differential equation, right? But how do I do this? I need to solve this equation to find xh, right? And I can do this precisely because the thing is not degenerate. And now a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky because it involves geometry. So this, the fact that it is closed means that it is invariant by the flow of XH. Is this totally mysterious what I say? 
yeah, I think it should somehow be. Uh, so you, you see what, uh, yeah, okay, let, let me just outsource this to someone. You saw what Anton was doing today. He was defining some dynamics. Well, he didn't say, call it dynamics, but he was drawing some curves in a space. And then he was carrying some objects along these curves, right? His parallel transport was that. I want to do the same thing, but with differential forms. So he was carrying vectors. I will be carrying covectors, but actually wedges of covectors, right? Right. The, the, the DQ and DP are covectors. Now I will multiply them together and carry along the trajectory. Well, actually, since they're covectors, you have probably guessed that I should carry them back from the final point point to the initial point, but whatever, I'm carrying them along the trajectory. And what I'm saying is that if I carry a symplectic form along the Hamiltonian flow, I get the same symplectic form, okay? This is what I call invariance. And when I say the same is, okay, the symplectic form is a bunch of skew symmetric operations at each point of the phase space, right? I can compute its value on two vectors at one point, then I can carry these two vectors along the curve and carry this symplectic form along the curve and compute it again. And saying that I get the same form is that I get the same value. So I get the same result. Uh, this is wave enhanced. If you want to do it geometrically, I will just write one line. And if you understand what is this good, if not, it's not really important. I'm not going to comment on it, but there is a proof to uh, say that it's invariant. So omega is invariant by, by the flow of xh. And what you need to compute is the lead derivative of xh applied to omega. And there, Cartan's magic formula. And this is an official name for the formula. Uh, you are supposed to compute this was that. So first, differentiate the contract. And you add first contract and differentiate, and you apply all this to H and uh, oh, sorry, to omega, obviously. Oops. And the first term vanishes because D omega vanishes, right? D omega is vanishes. And the first, the second term is D of this. And this guy we know from here, it's called DH. So this guy vanishes because D squares to zero. So the whole thing vanishes. Okay, stop, stop the fancy geometry. Uh, but I still, I will still give you uh, an exercise on this, on this uh, subject. And I have to say that this is a little bit a tricky exercise. So exercise two now, put a star here. Um, <laughs> how do I phrase it? So let's say I give you a symplectic form and a differential equation and a differential equation. And in our language, this is the same as omega and the vector field and the vector field. Let's call it whatever v. No, v is a bad letter, small v. Uh, 
Um, and let's say, let us say that V preserves omega. So in, th in that sense, I just described. The question is, can we say something about conservation of energy? And it's a tricky question because I didn't tell you what energy I want to conserve, right? So the actual question is, can we define something that looks like an energy that will be conserved by the flow of this vector field? Or given a function that looks like an energy and the vector field that preserves omega, can we say that they talk to each other? Okay, this question will be important in the third lecture. Is it okay up to now? Because I'm locally closing the chapter of geometry and I will go to numerics. Okay. Again, if questions pop up, if questions arise now or later, I'm available by mail, or if I still hang out in the chat, uh, feel free. Premier, what is a contract? Ah, contract, okay. Uh, did you did you uh, listen to Avent? Well, actually no, but I, I have read the-, the Okay, uh, waving hands. Differential forms, differential one forms behave like covectors at each point. Okay, what are covectors? They are dual two vectors, right? Dual means that I can multiply them and I get a number. Okay, differential n forms behave like multiple covectors. Okay, with some commutation properties, so they they actually skew symmetric. Uh, and what does it mean? It means that I can plug vectors inside. And if I plug enough vectors, I get a number. Contract is I take one vector and I plug it into one slot. And that I, then I get a covector of degree, which is one less than I the one I started with. Okay. So contract is plugging a vector into, into a differential form as an argument. Now I'm using the word vector and covector, but actually I should say vector field and covector field. So I will be doing this at each point of the phase space. So instead of a number in, as a final result, I will get a function, okay? If not, ask me again. So the contract is that function. Yeah, so the, the contract is evaluate a differential form on a vector field. Yeah, yeah, now I see, thank you. But, but some slots can still remain empty, okay? <clears throat> okay, now numerics in 15 minutes. something which is a one year probably course. Uh, we realized that sometimes we meet differential equations <clears throat> that we cannot solve by hand. Then uh, back in the days of Lagrange, they were just computing approximations. We will do the same, but in a more automatized way. So using a machine. Let me start with a simple thing. So in 1D, forget all what I said before, I'm looking at the differential equation, x dot equals V of x. 
an autonomous first order differential equation. What is the solution to it? When I'm asking a question half the time, it's kind of a tricky question. But the solution to it is x of t is x of zero plus integral v of x of t dt, right? So actually, I have a function that depends on time. Okay, depends in some weird way because I have I have v that depends on x that itself depends on time, and I just integrate this function, which is a very normal perception. I want to compute the variation of the coordinate. I will integrate the velocity. So actually, what you have done or you will do at some point in the classes of numerical analysis, you will spend a great deal of time computing the integrals of the function. So this is my v, this is my t, and this is the thing I want to compute. Just the area under the curve. Uh, and the first natural idea is I will just do it by the definition of the integral. So I will cut this interval into pieces and I will approximate my integral by rectangles. Wow. Okay, my rectangles don't really look rectangular. But how do I do this? I have several choices. I need always to pick a point in the interval and then draw this rectangle. So two natural choices would be this one. So I just, every time I take the left point and that one, every time I take the right point. Right. Uh, and then my integral will be approximately the sum of the areas of these rectangles, of rectangles. Now, how does this help me in solving differential equations? Or how this is different from solving differential equations? Can I just can, can I just do this every time? Can I just draw the velocity curve and integrate it to the coordinate? What is my issue? I mean, obviously there is an issue if I'm asking. The, the issue is that actually I don't have this curve. What I have is x of zero written somewhere? Maybe let me let me draw two plots x and v again of t. I have some x of zero here, and from that I can compute the velocity. So this is v of x of zero. And this is the only, the only thing I know. So now, how do I get to the next point in space? Well, I have to integrate the velocity. And now I have no choice because in that, in that picture, I cannot choose the end point of the interval. I don't know it, but I can still choose the first point of the interval. So that will be my first step. I draw a rectangle. I calculated its area. That will be some delta t. I add this area to my x. I get another point in space. OK. Now I go back. So this is 
x of delta t. I use that to compute another v, f of x of delta t. And I iterate the procedure. Okay, so actually every time I do it, my x of t plus delta t is equal to x of t plus delta t times v of x of t. And I repeat the thing. This guy has a name. It's called the Euler method. Now, actually, nothing forbids me to say that x is a vector variable and v is a vector variable, right? So in the examples that interest us, x would be q1, qn, q1, pn. And v would be what it is, would be the components of the Hamiltonian flow. Okay. Exercise three, or maybe task. But all this provided that you do a little bit of computer program. Do this for the examples one and two from the previous lecture. Okay, so if, if you don't do programming, then just let it go. If you do some programming, this is a very kind of a very simple procedure, right? You have a bunch of variables here, you have some function that you can compute knowing these variables and you just iterate this thing. Now, obviously, if you want thing to work well, you need to, to choose delta t, the time step to be sufficiently small. And that, if you know Taylor series, for example, would, would mean that you approximate well the derivative by this finite difference. But if you do program this, do it two times. Do it first for delta, delta t, which is sufficiently small, and then try pushing the limits a little bit. So take a delta t, which is not small, and see what happens. OK? Th that's why, actually, I sort of negotiated a break tomorrow. So you have two days to do this, OK? Is the question clear? If you don't do programming, well, don't, 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 don't struggle with it for two days because anyway, I will show you what happens next time. But somehow pedagogically, it's nice to see what happens if you do it on your own, not just the cartoon that I will show you. Okay, another option is to ask someone who is in the room who did this. For example, I see Daria who is who had this this the first exercise, I think, at some point. Did I lose anyone? Did I lose everyone? Uh, okay, some people say it's clear. I will clean up the notes and I will put them online hopefully today. 
So if something technical is missing, you will have the you have, will have them. Okay, I think for me it's a good point to stop. If uh, there are no further questions on geometry or on numerical methods. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. Let me only just uh, some co comment. You told uh, mm -hmm. about some parallel transport and derivative, but you consider it a lead derivative on the vector field, not uh, covariant derivative that I consider is also not quite clear. Yeah, uh, that's what that's about a, parallel transport. Uh, yeah, yeah that's 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 a totally fair remark, and I also promised to be cheating a little bit in these lectures, right? So I'm at least I'm consistent with what I say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what, what Anton say is saying is that uh, depending on what objects you transport along the curves and depending on the operations and differential geometry you use, there is an appropriate meaning for that. But actually, okay, for the lead derivative, this is a derivative in a sense. So you, 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 would, you would take a differential form, you have some mapping of the phase space to itself, right? I will say M to M. And this F, the mapping is integrating the flow. Okay, so following the trajectories is the mapping F. Then what the lead derivative measures is you take the form omega, you pull it back, and you compare it with the initial omega. Right, and you do it infinitesimally. And then you can prove that this is actually the same as the Cartan's magic formula. So th there is a way to compute this using this formula. Okay. Well, you, you did ask the question, so I cannot ask if it answers your question. Uh, yes, the thing I just it was not the question. I yeah, just yeah. wanted to comment that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Not, so the, 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 not the, the same. Uh, I, I was considered this is another de de also derivative, but another derivative is uh, other properties. And uh, to get it, we need uh, so you, you see, you have this lead derivative on arbitrary manifold, you need only vector field. But yeah. uh, uh, for the connections that I'm going to yes, consider, yes, yes, something yes. different we need to fix, for, for example, Riemannian metric to get this. Uh, yes covariant derivative and uh, this so, so ju just for <laughs> just to, to clarify, clarify it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes yeah, yeah, the, that's, that's true so different. and it's an important point because actually when you do things in rn basically you don't see much difference between a lot of objects but mm -hmm. when you do things on the manifold like the usual derivative the covariant derivative the lead derivative all these objects are not the same Okay. Yes, yes, and I would even say that this operation, a lead derivative, is from uh, differential topology, not from differential geometry. But what is the different? In differential geometry, we should fix some objects, some additional object on the manifold. And mm -hmm. this operation, you can see this. Uh, on yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Exists on arbitrary, on arbitrary. Yeah, manifold. absolutely. That's what I. That's kind of what I said. I have a manifold. I have a mapping from it to itself, mm -hmm. and I look at some objects that live on the manifold and they actually well the lead derivative is a way to more or less give a uniform description of uh, functions vector fields and differential forms how they evolve during this this mapping okay so thank you very much thank you for the remark and thanks uh, people for questions. listening Mm -hmm. So if there is no more questions or comments,